Well, I started this series of messages last week on crosswords. If I can remind you of the story, I went down to spend the night with my mother who had recently been having some health issues, and we were just taking turns spending the night with my mother, which is an awesome thing to do. And it was a whole lot more fun. My dad was still alive to do that, but uh, we miss him so much. But anyway, we, I was down there with my mother just talking one evening. She said, you know, I, I'm not subscribing to the local newspaper anymore. I said, why is that, Mom? She said, well, you know, the only reason we ever took the newspaper was because your dad really loved to do the crossword puzzle. Well, I thought about that, but just kind of let it leave my mind. And one night, leaving a real late at night, our elders' meetings always last too long, and we were just kind of making our way in between here and the skating rink up here. That thought came to my mind about the word crossword. I thought sort of thinking cross words. What are some words in our language that we use that refer to the cross? And so last week I confessed to you, you may have a different idea than I do, but the first word that comes to my mind when I think about what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me is the word sacrifice. And so last week we talked about sacrifice, but running a very close second is what we'll talk about today, which is the word love. You cannot talk about the cross without talking about God's love for us. And the greatest verse in the entire Bible about that is the simplest verse. In fact, I think if we took a poll today and asked, what is the most famous verse of Scripture in the entire Bible? Even non-believers know John 3, 16, don't they? But we don't often talk about verse 17 as well. So let me read those for you for a foundational text today as we talk about God's amazing love for us as we talk about the word crosswords again. It says in verse 16 of John chapter 3, these familiar words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But verse 17, we don't often read, it says, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And so let's pray real quickly and ask God's blessing over his word this morning. God, we love you and we thank you for the privilege to preach the gospel. What an honor, God, to preach the gospel. And especially, God, in this holy week, the most holy week of all, It's so cool, Father, to turn a passage of Scripture that reminds us of your amazing love. Thank you for your sacrifice, and thank you, God, that it was motivated out of your love for us. And so teach us today, Father, maybe something new and fresh about your amazing love for us. That's my prayer, and I pray it in the strong and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the first thing, if you want to write this on your outline, I think those were posted. By the way, my daughter wanted to remind you that we have a church app, and there you can get the outlines. I think all the blanks are filled in if you're doing that, but you'll already know this. But the first thing, if you want to fill on your outline today, is this, the world's greatest verse. Obviously, this is the world's greatest verse. It's described us in three different ways as we talk about the love of God. Number one, write this in your notes, if you will. Notice the wonder of God's love. Well, that's given to us the very first part of this verse, verse 16, for God so loved the world. Let's first talk about the word love. He so loved the world. This is agape love. This is a love that does not say, I love you because of something. In other words, often us young men, when we see a pretty girl and fall in love with her and we date her, we say, I love you because you're pretty. Maybe somebody says to somebody, I love you because you have a fancy car, or you have a lot of money, or because of what you can do for me. Agape love says this. This is radically different. I love you despite This is a love that says, you can't do anything for me, but I love you anyway. In fact, the Bible says that we're sinners by nature and by choice, that we all fall short of his glory. There's none righteous, no, not even one. There's no reason for God to love us. And despite that, it says that he still loves us. That's agape love. God so loved the world. He loved us despite who we are. If you don't hear anything I say in this message today, please hear me when I say this. God absolutely loves you. You don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. I'll never deserve that. But still yet, he loves us. And so God so loved. Then the word world. The word world, which is an interesting word actually in Greek, it's a word that's probably familiar. It's the word cosmos in Greek, and it literally means this. I thought this was interesting. It's the sum total of the material universe. God loves it all. He created it, and he loves it all. I think it goes even further than that because I want to make sure you hear this. God loves every person who has ever lived is living now or will ever live. He loves it all. He loves the whole world. God doesn't just love white people or black people or people that smell good or don't smell good, tall people, short people, people that have hair and don't have hair. He loves all people. He loves the whole world. Listen, there's enough enough power and love in one drop of the blood from the cross to express love to the entire world. So know that he so loved 
the world. I wrote some random thoughts on my notes. Let me share these with you. This love is stronger than death. This love will not let you go. This love, what waters cannot quench. This love suffers long and is kind. This love simply never fails. Again, if you don't hear anything else I say today, please hear this. God so loved the world. God so loved you and he loved me and he loved the whole world. That's why this is the greatest verse in the Bible. So, again, the greatest verse starts with this whole idea of, again, if you wrote it in your notes, the wonder of God's love. Number two, notice the willingness of God's love. God's love, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The willingness of of God's cross, the willingness of God's love for us expressed through the cross is amazing. He was willing to give his only begotten son. Most of you have heard me tell the story when my children were much younger, we wanted to teach them about what it meant to give. And especially around Christmas time, when it's all about getting when you're a child, we wanted them to understand what it meant to give. And so when they were very small and could understand it, we would tell them around Christmas time that we wanted them to go gather up some of their toys that they could give to somebody else at Christmas time. We didn't want them to find the toy they didn't play with anymore. It was something that was in great condition, something they really cared about. And often they'd come out of the toy box with something that perhaps they hadn't played with in a year's time or something they didn't really care about anymore. We'd say, nope, go back and do it again. At that time, we lived in McKaysville, Georgia, and we had a local center where they could, we could take these things and then we'd be given to people that were less privileged than we were. I remember walking in there one day when they were carrying their toys, and a, a little boy came out with their parents pushing a bicycle that had rust on it, and the tires were flat, and they had come to get that bike for that boy for his Christmas present. It needed a lot of repairs. Our girls wouldn't want to play with anything like that, and he was so proud, smiling from ear to ear because he got this bicycle that most of us would throw away. We wanted our kids to understand what that was like. And again, the nature would be to go find something I don't play with anything, something I don't care about anymore. Listen to this. God so loved the whole world that he gave his own. He didn't give the leftover something he didn't care about. The best. And he loves me so much that he gave the very best he had for you. And so hear that again. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The word only begotten is an interesting complex word. It's monogenous, and it literally means this, the one and the only. The one and the only. He gave the very best he had. The depth of God's love for you is that he gave the very best he had for you. God certainly could have sent an angel, couldn't he? He could have sent some other creative being, but no, he went and found the very most priceless thing he had to demonstrate his love for you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Again, the wonder of God's love, but then we see again the willingness of God's love, and finally notice the will of God's love. The will of his love. Again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here it is, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. The will of God's love is that you would be saved. It is God's absolute will that all people would come to him. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. It is God's will, it's God's desire that every person, again, who's ever lived, is living now, will ever live, will come to him in the free part of sin and find salvation. It is God's will for sure. The word eternal life is a word alios. It literally means this, life of God. I love that. He wants you to have his life. Isn't that awesome? It'd be one thing to say you could have life, but he wants you to have, I love the Bible talks about God wants to give us his wisdom, his peace, and now his life. He literally wants to implant within you the life that he has. And he does that by bringing Jesus to this world to die on the cross for you and for me that we might have eternal life. So we talk about the greatest verse. Now let's talk about the second point in your outline, which is the world's greatest victory. The world's greatest victory. In verse 17, we read these words, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Interesting. A couple things, write them down. Number one, the reason Jesus came. There's such false 
theology, false ideas, false beliefs in the world about why Jesus came. So many people think that Jesus came to judge the world or to be a judge to the world or to get those people that were bad people, right? God's out to get, he's a Shylock in heaven who's come to get his pound of flesh for the day. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the Bible comes and says that he did not come to judge the world. Jesus came to not judge the world, but to give life to the world. It's interesting, this word sinned. He says, for God did not send. The word sin in Greek is a word apostatello. It's where we get the word apostle. You've heard the word apostle before. Apostle is a, a, a messenger on a mission. That's what that is. Jesus was a messenger. He was a missionary to this world, a messenger for this world. He was sent on a journey with a, with a mission. Jesus' mission was to save the whole world. And so people think that Jesus came to get them. Jesus came to judge them. Jesus is out to get them in this world. It's the total opposite. Jesus wants to give you his life. So the reason Jesus came, he came as an apostle. Second of all, write this down, the result of Jesus' coming. Not just the reason he came. What was the result when Jesus came? Everything changed when Jesus came. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The result was salvation came. Before that, there was no hope. There was no glory. There was no eternal life. Through Christ Jesus and only through Christ Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, his demonstration of love for you and me, can there be salvation? It is through him. Did you notice what the text said again? It said again at the end of that, that the world might be saved through him. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's exclusive here. Jesus is the only way. In fact, Jesus is the very way that can happen. Now, there's another passage. If you want to turn there, you can. In John chapter 14, I just want to take just a minute here and talk about one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. I've read this passage in every environment you can imagine. It's real fitting at a funeral. It's real fitting It may be even a wedding or any other sitting. It's just fitting for anything. But it describes for us, certainly John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the whole world, is the gospel in a nutshell. But what does that really look like, and how does that apply to your life? And in this time, there's so many people out there that are worried. There's so many people that are struggling right now. You're worried about financial issues or relational issues or what's going on at work or what's going on in the world, what's going on with your health. In a time where we're so prone maybe to worry, Let me give you some peace. Let me give you a reason to have hope. Let me give you a reason to have faith in a time like this and what that faith looks like and what that faith must be in. You know this passage well. Let me read John chapter 14, those first three verses. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receiving to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Three simple things. This is so important. If you're listening out there right now, or you listen to this by radio next week, please hear this. It is absolutely God's will that you have a personal relationship with him. Not that you say a prayer and say, I'm saved. No, that, that you become a fully devoted follower of Christ Jesus, that you absolutely give your life to him and he gives his life to you. That's called a relationship. You're not saved because of religion. You're not saved because you're a member of a church. You're not saved because you got baptized. You're saved because you yielded your life to your Savior Jesus. You confessed your sin and asked for his forgiveness and now you live for him. It's not based upon your works. It's based upon his finished work on the cross. But three simple things. Number one, you must have faith in a person. Faith in a person. This isn't faith in a religion. This isn't faith in an organization. He simply says this, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Our faith must have a direct focus. It has to be on something. And in this case, our faith is in Christ Jesus. He's the only hope for your salvation. So if you're going to be saved today, listen, your faith must be in Christ. Number two, our faith is in a place. Our faith is in a place. I love verse two. Look what he says there. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you for I go to prepare a place for you. My brother Rick is sitting here in the room with us right now. We were talking this past week. He said, I hope we have mansions next to each other one day when we get to heaven. 
And I said, well, I had to be close to a body of water because you know how much he loves to fish and do those kinds of things. I hope we do have a place overlooking water. That'd be a wonderful thing. But we have faith not just in a person, but faith in an absolute place. Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. If Jesus says that, you can take him to the bank. He's done exactly what he said he would do. And so our faith is in a person, Jesus Christ. That's how we're saved. Faith in a place. And then one last thing, faith in a promise. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's the greatest promise that's left to be fulfilled in this whole world. That Jesus said, I'm coming to receive you to myself. It's more important than ever today for you to really search your soul. To know that you know that you know that you don't just have religion, but you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Religion will not save you, only Christ will. So we're talking about the importance of love as it relates to the cross. That God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ was willing to die for us. He did that so that you could have faith in a person. That's Jesus. He's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Faith in a place, this place, heaven. I can't wait to go be there. This is not our home, praise God. This is not the way it will always be. We have an eternal home that he's prepared for us, and we can claim the promise today, no matter what the world has to say about it. One day, Jesus will split the sky. He'll come back to receive his church himself. You can count on it. You can absolutely take it to the bank. And so the greatest verse in the entire Bible talks about the greatest victory that ever occurred. And my friends, that victory has already taken place. It is a finished work, what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. Those cross words, praise God for his sacrifice, praise God for his demonstration of love. Because of that, we have hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we do love you. And I know there's plenty of people out there perhaps listening and watching, Father, that don't have the hope of security in their heart. Maybe, God, the reason you've allowed what's happening in our world to happen is that we would reevaluate we are, where we are with you. When things are coasting along and things seemingly are going well, God, it's so easy to neglect our faith. And so, Father, I want to pray a simple prayer for those that would be watching or listening in some way, even those gathered here with us, God that we would search our hearts and souls to make sure that we don't just have religion, but we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That relationship starts when we repent of our sin and ask for your forgiveness. When, God, we confess to you that we fall short of your glory. You told us in the Word, there's none righteous, no, not even one, for all is sin and come short of the glory of God. God, I pray today that we'd recognize that. We're all sinners by nature and by choice, but praise God, that's not the end of the story. This text tells us so clearly, God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You did not love us because we deserved it. You did not love us, God, because it was the right thing to do. You loved us despite who we are to demonstrate your love for us so that we might be saved. And so if you're out there listening right now, if you're watching this right now, if you'd find a lonely place to cry out to him and ask for his forgiveness, ask for him to forgive you of your sin and to fill you with his spirit and to save your soul, I promise you, if you mean business with him, he'll hear and he'll respond. In fact, if that happens in your life this week, reach out to us. There's all kinds of ways to do that. Reach out to us. We want the encouragement of knowing that you've given your heart to Christ and we want to help you walk forward in your Christian walk. God, I thank you again for your love for us. Thank you for this time we could spend together. Thank you especially for the cross. Because there, Father, we see your sacrifice. And we so, see so clearly, God, your amazing love for us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, church. We love you. Are we good? All right, praise the Lord. I want to go. And I'll tell you another thing. So just for a reminder, guys, there'll be nothing here next Sunday. I don't know whether Matthew's going to come and do his thing. He might do that, I guess. But um, Daniel will be at my house, and uh, we'll just do church there. And you guys be at your place and station ready to do the Lord's Supper together, okay? Thank you so much for being here today. Love you guys. <laughs> They're going to run me off when I start preaching them hour-long sermons when we get through with this, aren't they?
I just turned, I just turned that system completely off. There's no reason for really that'll do anything we need done in here for the 